Hello, and welcome to the special Cube presentation. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube here with a special analyst angle with the Cube research for VMware's Cloud Foundation Transform program. It's a new era in private cloud innovation and value it here. Christoph Bertrand in studio at Palo Alto with me and coming in remotely from our Boston studio, Dave Vellante and Rob Streche with the Cube research to really unpack the state of the union with VMware Cloud Foundation and what it means for Broadcom, now VMware, as they transform their company and bring new value to the market. Gents, great to see you guys. Thanks for coming into the Cube remotely. Good to see you. Hey, John. Hey there. All right, off. so let's get into it, guys. Um, Christoph, we were chatting before we came on. Um, you know, we've been talking about this power law for years. We're going to get into that in a second, but let's set the table. Uh, VMware's trotting out all their top execs. The moment in time happening right now is that VMware, now part of Broadcom, has kind of cleared the runway a little bit. A little bumpy on the runway to get everything together in the, in the acquisition. Broadcom, a 10 to one stock split. Everyone's kind of high-fiving each other. Certainly on the VMware side, they joined the right team. <laughs> the semiconductor business is booming, but VMware's transitioning. And was, the smoke is starting to clear a little bit now. And guys, I want to get into this now because there's a new table being set with VMware. What's your, what's your take right now as you see it today? Well, I think it's really threefold, right? The first one is I think on the partner side, they have clearly um, sort of reorganized themselves, looked at uh, adopting the Broadcom program, uh, cleaned up a bunch of complex uh, licensing questions for both end users and um, cloud service partners. So I think that's really very powerful. Uh, on the product side, I think the big challenge and the big opportunity is integration not only internally between the various uh, components of uh, VCF, but also externally. And that's going to be absolutely absolutely key to the uh, ecosystem. And then, you know, obviously, Gen AI and AI, right? Uh, big topic, and they certainly have a great card to play uh, if they can deliver on this integration. I want to get into the um, technology side of it. We had Paul, uh, we had, um, uh, the CTO, no, the CPO come on. We had the ecosystem partner go to market, uh, come on, talk about the partnerships. Uh, we also had the uh, president, Paul Turner, come on. Um, and so you got kind of an infrastructure managed, the, the workloads kind of vibe of VMware, but they had a lot of static with the partnerships. So they had a lot of, um, uh, I would say, problems with canceling and rebooting their channel, their partner, they changed it from partner connection to Broadcom Advantage. We heard that from the executive. What's your take on this? Is it going to be clearer and cleaner? What's your evaluation of the whole partner network? Well, obviously time will tell, but certainly they're making the right moves. Uh, there's no question about this. When you give uh, partners visibility over their margins, you're doing something right. Uh, that's the first point. The other is uh, part is really there is an opportunity here for value add for different types of partners partners, whether they're resellers, whether they're cloud service providers. I think what I've heard is uh, really Broadcom VMware is trying, not trying to get into those added value services because they want to leave them to the partners. And I think that's very smart. So again, time will tell, but it looks like all of the components are in place. Uh, it's time to move forward uh, and uh, let's see what they can do. Uh, guys, uh, Dave and Rob, I want to get into the private AI in a second, but I want to first unpack, is Broadcom setting the table properly? The channel piece looks good, looks like they're putting some visibility and distribution is going to be providing support. We heard that from them clearly. They're really, really clean on how to make money. I like that, I think they're doing a good job cleaning it. It's definitely not the old VMware, it's the new VMware under Broadcom. But Rob, we had um, the Paul Turner on, he's the chief product officer. Kubernetes was a big part of this whole, I'm going to run everything and automate everything. What do you think about the current situation around VMware's VCF approach for private cloud? Well, I, I think they needed to make a lot of those changes to bring everything together. And I think as they made the licensing changes, uh, you know, Kubernetes used to be, I wouldn't say second class citizen, but it used to be a, a plugin on top of what is now VCF, bringing it in as a first class citizen, being part of it, managing everything the same, same observability, same workflow, being able to do the clusters at scale, definitely gives them a better play. Also, I think some of the stuff that was announced around upgradability and being able to do that at scale is pretty impressive about what Paul was talking about and some of the keys to operating uh, really these massive infrastructures in an efficient way. And I, I think that was that was clear coming from Paul. Chris came on, talked about the State of the Union, addressed some of the licensing issues. Guys, I want to ask the question around the viability of the, the, the news. They talk about portability. Is 
private cloud a going to be a thing and for VCF? That's the big question. VCF, clearly a strategy they're taking around this new market, distributed computing, edge, on-premise, cloud, cloud operations. But the big bet is that the enterprises will adopt uh, VCF private cloud. So that's the, that's the big question. If it does, they have a winning product, good strategy. What's your take? So, I mean, VMware, uh, Cloud Foundation was always the underpinning of on-prem cloud. And so now as we move to, to training outside of the cloud, can it be the underpinning of private AI, AI on-prem? And that's the strategy. And I think it's going to come down to uh, understanding the customer adoption barriers. And we certainly have some data on that that we can share, removing those barriers and then laying out a roadmap and executing on that roadmap such that Customers can train and ultimately run these models with inference, uh, both on-prem and at the edge. And that's the strategy. I think it's a clean strategy. It's simplified the, the licensing model. So that makes sense, leaving enough meat in the bone for the partners. And now it's game on. Christoph, clearly they want to go after the top 2,000 customers or less, but that want VCF that might be viable. Um, are you happy with some of the things that they've introduced, portability and other things? Is it, does that hang together? Yes, it does. I mean, look at the variability that's going to happen in those environments. You have to be able to be very flexible as an end user. One end user will not look like the next one. So you need to uh, really be able to go with the flow and you also be, need to be able to do this at scale, which I think we cannot <laughs> say enough <laughs> times, at scale. It's, it's really about, of this capability. So, uh, and also Rob, I think brought up a very good point around Kubernetes. I think this is, uh, you know, embrace it, uh, run with it, uh, make it an, an, an equal partner. And I think that's exactly what uh, they need to do. Now, at the same time, as we think about adoption of Gen AI and AI sort of use cases, it's going to be about quick wins. And I really liked uh, the messaging around that. Um, there are still some, I think lots of questions around the economics of uh, early AI implementations. So we'll, we'll definitely have to keep an eye on that. Rob, what's your take on the um, channel approach with VCF as it looks at trying to refresh uh, VCF's go-to-market strategy to support the portfolio and the partner ambitions? I mean, um, they're putting support mechanisms closer to the resellers and VARs. The distribution is going to monetize that and hopefully be front, close to the front lines. Will there be an enabled market for VCF? How do you see that? Yeah, I, I liked where they were talking and, uh, about how they're going to bring that transparency as kind of Christoph brought up, that you understand where your gross margins are going to come from, you know how it's going to be applied, you can use that money in whichever way you want to from a marketing or sales enablement or what have you. you as long as you have those capabilities to go and execute on it, I think, like you said, being able to do and handle first level support uh, at the distribution level, that's something that VMware had actually pioneered many years, probably almost a decade back. And I think it was just not done in a consistent manner. And I think that's the name of the game with the Broadcom Advantage program is really they're bringing consistency to everybody. I think they're leveling the playing field for everybody. Uh, I, I actually found it very interesting uh, that I think the CSPs are going to actually play a bigger role in this uh, as they go forward and not a smaller role. Like everybody was really worried when they started to go into AWS and Google and Azure, which they're still going to be there uh, in a little bit slightly different manner, yeah. but it's the same stack everywhere. And the CSPs and the new CSP program under the Broadcom Advantage, I think really will level the playing field for those CSPs and allow them to grow in different ways and differentiate on top of that platform. Uh, Amar uh, Mohammed, Vice President of Partners, was very clear. He laid out the, the targets, OEMs, hyperscalers, CSPs, and resellers bars with distributors providing the support to the front lines. Very clear, I mean, this is not like the old, you know, fast and loose, just sprawling organic VMware ecosystem that grew over the past decade and a half. This is kind of a very focused and the mechanics are clear on the money making. So, you know, it looks like it's set up nicely. Um, the, the, the real question is, you know, is there enough meat in the bone to provide services around VS, VCF for the partners? Because, you know, the real story here that we're burying the lead on is private AI is the application. We're talking about AI, generative AI is the new application workload that VMware wants to manage under the covers. So, you know, the, the, the question to really squint through this is to say, does VCF really provide the system and the platform 
for those generative AI applications. So guys, what's your take on this? Christoph, what's your opinion? We were talking before you came on camera that this is the, this is the, the number one question. Absolutely, well it's early stages, so I think the uh, focus on quick wins is going to be key. I uh, really like that approach. Uh, the, the reality is end users have to demonstrate that it works, that it is actually something that's not a crazy cost center. Uh, and when you think about the optimization that uh, VCF wants to bring to the table using, you know, uh, partial GPUs and allowing you to go from small to big, I think that's exactly the right approach. Now in time, uh, I do believe that it will really allow a new set of ecosystem partners to go build on those new applications, for lack of a better term, uh, and, and bring really more AI into those larger enterprises. Uh, so it's going to be interesting uh, to see. It's, it's going to change the ecosystem. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Rob put out a great paper, a research paper on private AI that VMware is showcasing in this. Dave uh, Vellante, Chris Wolf came on theCUBE and talked about um, private AI on SuperCloud, and they've been presenting to uh, that in the marketplace. And early days, I won't say they were laughed at, but people, oh, there's really no strategy there. Turns out they made the good call. And I want to walk through this because we were riffing in the end of 2022 about the power law. And, and we were seeing it early because we were kind of playing with uh, uh, you know, RAG at that time with our data. So it was clear to us that there was going to be a diversity of language models and ultimately different multimodal foundation models, which actually is playing out now. So we got the research right, but we published it in 2023. Let's pull that up. I want you to give your take because I think the real question about private AI is it's legit. It's now a category and actually everyone's talking about it. In fact, Databricks, the CEO uh, was showcasing on their event, small language models, which is essentially what we've been saying with special models. Take us through the power law and let's discuss why this is pointing to private AI being a winning strategy. Well, the whole idea of the power law, and John, you're the first one who really brought this to my attention and we applied the, uh, the notion of a power law to Gen AI. And the idea is that there's an inverse relationship between the size of the model and the, and the model specificity. So the size of the model here is on the vertical axis and the model specificity, specificity in the horizontal, where the industry is going to be applying their own data, their own proprietary data to create competitive advantage. And so, and when we talk about, is there enough meat in the bone for the partners? This is where I think partners really have to think about shifting their business models, because look at VMware is not going to be the data expert, but there's tons of opportunity for partners to really help customers identify that proprietary data, how to leverage that data and make it specific for their industry. And then really make the AI sing beyond, beyond what is just code generation and customer support. Some of those quick wins that, that Christoph was talking about, that's great. Hit some singles, generate some cash flow and some, some gain sharing, and then really drive unique competitive advantage along that horizontal axis. That's really what the, the power law suggests. I want to bring Rob and Christoph in here because um, one, that's the, the obvious thing about, hey, the data is proprietary. It's, it's your intellectual property. It's, you don't want to leave. We get that, that's, everyone's talking about that. But generative AI applications, Christoph and Rob, is beyond just that. It's not just data processing in a silo, it's integrating data. So let's get into that piece right now and, and, and discuss why this power law is more important than just saying private AI is just good for your data on premise. There's actually the application of the generative AI workloads. What's your, what's your take on this, guys? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I, when you start to look at how you bring this to bear and what use cases are being actually, you know, generated and solved for, people have been all over the map and we will have some data on that as well. And when I did the examining, uh, the report on examining the VMware Private AI Foundation with NVIDIA Vision, and you started to look at how they were approaching this, it this is a lot of where organizations, be it CSPs, be it those uh, VARs and SIs will be able to generate revenue. Uh, it's one of the places. And also, VMware is not getting rid of a lot of the other use cases that they've built on VCS, Z, VCF over the years in their CSP market and allowing people to iterate and innovate on top of that platform. So what I see is that, again, a lot of people want to bring the AI to the data versus the other way around still. And that really, you know, again, drives home a private AI strategy or a private cloud strategy as well. 
Christoph, let's get into the stack because at the end of the day, the bet here is that private AI will work. The data points to it being a category. The model, the power law shows that it's relevant. When you look at the stack, VCF isn't just vSphere. So VMware is well known for managing workloads, virtualization, we went through that, that era. The next era of VMware's future is going to be around how do you manage more GPUs? What's, what's the workload management if the workload is generative AI, not just private AI, it's all generative AI. What's, the stack has to hang together. Got networking, storage, compute, all there. Um, that, that's the big bet here in the stack. Right, it is, but at the same time, think about the uh, other dimension we haven't covered, and, and it's one of the areas maybe we should talk about a little, bit, a little bit, bit more in this context, which is compliance and governance. I mean, the private cloud approach and private AI is really also a way to secure your IP. You don't want to give your IP away to your competitors. Uh, you want to actually use this as a competitive advantage, and you may need, in many cases, uh, to run this on your own premises for all sorts of reasons. In other cases, you may want to go uh, run your AI model somewhere else uh, in a cloud or in, uh, through a CSP, whatever the case may be. So I think what we're looking at is this hybrid distributed AI or Gen AI model that I think could emerge from having the flexibility with the integrated stack. Again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Integration is going to be everything on this one. Yeah. Guys, this, this, is, the, this, is, the, this is the situation. They're cleaning up the contracts, the channel, VCF is targeted clearly at private cloud innovation. Private AI is a category, that's the entry point. Kind of where it goes from here is going to be dependent upon what customers think. So Dave, you got data on this. What's actually happening in the marketplace when it comes down to the, when the rubber meets the road? What are customers thinking? Where are we? What does the data show? What's the analysis? Yeah, if we could bring up the data that we have um, on the customer survey from our partners ETR, it's in the field right now. And so, this is a survey of 1,200, more than 1,200 IT decision makers. 25% of them said they're, they're, they're not in production yet. Those that are in production are doing things like you said, code generation, customer support, content marketing. We're starting to see some IT support trickle in and collaboration. But this 313 here said that they've got barriers to putting uh, Gen AI into production. So they're still in the evaluation stage. You can see that's the huge percentage here, but what are the big barriers? Just like Christoph was saying, data privacy, security concerns, legal, compliance, regulatory concerns. And Rob, this is the first time we've seen lack of budget really pop in, it's up to now 20%. We know from the other surveys that 42% of the customers tell us that they're stealing from other budgets to fund Gen AI. So it's important, again, back to Christoph's notion of hitting you know, small wins, quick wins, hitting singles, but they've got to really start to show that return and they need something like private AI that they can trust so they can build the infrastructure around that so they know that their data is not leaking into the LLM vendor or to competitors. And that's really the foundation for going beyond the current chatty Gen AI applications. That's great analysis. I think that points to the activity. One, bifurcation of budgets. That's kind of happening and cleaning up. People are investing in Gen AI projects that are going to drive the future. And the private AI shows the compliance, Christoph, that compliance, privacy, legal has, is holding things up. Guys, bifurcation of budgets, we're seeing budgets being approved for Gen AI, maybe some tests, we've seen that on the, on the data. But look at the, look at the, look at the, um, the bottleneck there. We're evaluating and the next thing is governance, privacy, which we just talked about. What needs to happen with VCF and the market to break this log jam, if you will? Call it a log jam, mainly it's more of a, I won't say blocker, but it's just evolution. You know, I was talking to a large bank the other day and they said, you know the old saying, move fast and break things. They said, we got to move fast, but we can't break things. So they need infrastructure that they, they don't have to worry about and take away that heavy lifting and, and they can't break things. So they got to be able to trust it. And so, there's, that's why there's so many companies are still in the evaluation phase, but we're, I think by the, by the second half, really into Q4, we're going to start to see really substantive use cases hitting the enter enterprise, starting to throw off enough cash so that we can gain share, enough ROI, big enough ROI, so that we can invest in future AI projects. Rob, you yeah. did your white paper um, and re research report on this. The use cases kind of show the low hanging fruit is not risky. Are there new projects coming in beyond the whole chat bots and agent stuff? What, and how do you see the, their ability to execute with this kind of this transition to evaluate and break that governance, uh, crack the code on governance? 
Yeah, and I think a lot of people were getting real, and again, it spiked in production use for marketing and sales collateral has really spiked again. So that uh, actual summarization uh, and being able to build content has really been the driving force. And I, I think to Dave's point, it's sometimes hard to see the ROI on that that isn't with people or things of that nature and, you know, moving people into different uh, areas to work on different things or what have you. And I, I think what has been happening is that people are learning how to work with the AI in these different places, especially in code development. I think, you know, code pilots was a low hanging fruit. I think <laughs> some people took a little st step back after the whole Samsung thing where some of their code had leaked out into, you know, a public LLM. And I think people are retrenched and they get the value out of that to go faster, not break things and be able to yeah. bring something to production. But they also want to do it with those guardrails. And I think that to me is where a lot of people have kind of taken a step back and really started to look at, OK, how do I bring the right guardrails to my infrastructure yeah. and how do I roll that out. It's interesting you bring that up because the whole hallucination things drove a lot of the fear and paranoia around data leaking and then that kind of validated the, the data modeling around the specialty long tail power law. Christoph, you, you know, you've been covering data for years. Um, I mean, you just think data protection turns into cyber resilience. Is there a similar wave happening now where <laughs> the data products just be called gen AI, it's just renaming the same category. And by the way, you, you can't just bolt things on like the old days. So, you know, people have to zoom out and, and they're taking caution uh, right now from the data, but they ultimately have to jump in and you can't be half-assing gen AI. This is a, a categorical platform shift you got to do it right. What's your take on this? And then we'll kick it out to the guys to riff on this because you got to solve the governance problem. You got to solve the data problem. You got to make data available, but it's not your, it's not yesterday's data processing in the cloud deal. Exactly. And by the same token, I think the data protection processes are changing. So are two things going on. There's AI being used by data protection vendors, backup recovery, disaster recovery, et cetera, to uh, automate better, to better protect the whole infrastructure. Well, the whole infrastructure is now evolving to also include AI related data. And actually I expect that it will be a, a very large amount of extra data being generated when already it's hard enough to know what you have, where it is and protect it. So I do think that there will be some significant challenges with protecting those, let's call them workloads uh, for lack of a better term and data products. They are pure AI uh, in many cases, they're pure IP. Uh, and they're very valuable. Uh, so I expect to see an evolution. I do believe it's a great opportunity, again, for the ecosystem to come in and look at this holistically. Compliance, security, which we haven't talked about much, uh, and of course, the protection of data assets, either the original data or the, the data that's produced and supports those Gen AI and AI models in general terms. It's interesting, Dave, how this Gen AI basically collapses existing categories into one data protection, this, that's one big data platform. Rob, same thing's happening on Kubernetes and cloud native. Big part of Paul Turner's conversation is that we're, we're going to automate Kubernetes completely and take that away, make it boring and just part of the fabric uh, with, with um, networking and all the um, software defined stuff they've had over the years. So cloud native's collapsing, got microservices. We hear Jensen Wong on state saying NIMS and microservices, you know, you know, language NIMS. The whole cloud native piece is part of this too announcement. VCF has to run at scale on premise cloud and the edge, which VMware already has by the way with VCF. So what, what, how do you see the cloud native, I won't say collapsing, but consolidating to platform, uh, to a platform? Yeah, I, I think again, you and I have been talking about this for a while now around Kubernetes and the fact that Kubernetes really, you know, is solved for. It's 10 years old at this point in time. It again, it's not as old as VMware or, you know, doing virtual machines and partitioning and things of that nature. But when you start to look at Kubernetes and how they're building it in now, instead of it being another platform, it's part of the same platform. It's managed the same way. You get the scale, the security, and it's not complex. And I think that complexity and reducing and, you know, they want, everybody wants the easy button with Kubernetes. And I think that this is a good time for them to really jump in on that and bring it together. So I think, you know, as Paul had said, this is, this is pretty big stuff for VMware, making Kubernetes really and containers a first-class citizen in there, because that to me 
is you know when the we we've been talking about it how uh, it should be a cloud native con uh, instead of you know kubecon I, I think this is really you know the shark you know jumping the shark here i think yeah. you know when vmware says it's a first class citizen and we're going in all in on containers you got you got to believe that that's, uh, you know, we're there. If you look at the news and updates on the VCF on 5.2, this launch, all this is like a lot of piece parts that actually help scale, automate, and run things faster. This is kind of the VMware's sweet spot, how they their core competence is putting these platforms together. You know, Dave, we talk about in the cube pod all the time around how the market's changing at the SaaS level and platforms are becoming ecosystems we talk about all the time. The impact here is going to be at the application layer, Dave, because SaaS converts into Gen AI applications, which has data completely refabricated, re refactored, I should say, into a fabric, neural network, what do you want to call it, vectors tokens, cloud native thing consolidates, scales up, automates, runs. So platform engineering becomes now data operations and data engineering. That's going to impact the apps that come out. And we've been watching the SaaS. What's your angle on this? Because you know, if this tsunami, this Cambrian explosion of private AI kicks in, it'll fuel the generative AI global market. Well, I think a couple of things. One is you know, VCF 5.2, you mentioned it. It's, I think it marks a new era. In, in AI infrastructure because of the licensing, the unified licensing. And I think to your point, that enables applications to be built on top of it. I come back to governance. Uh, it's the number one barrier to taking things into production, privacy, trusted, you know, legal compliance, governance, but it can be the number one enabler as well. And I think to your question about applications, that's where all the business logic lives. And you really want to unlock that. We're going to go beyond just a simple sort of request and retrieve model. And we're going to get into systems of agency where agents are actually acting on data that lives in applications, that business logic that's going to be harmonized. This is where the value add is for the ecosystem. And you're going to have agents uh, operating on behalf of humans yeah. uh, in a trusted manner. And that is the future of AI in the, in the near to midterm. What I love about the generative AI, it's a runtime environment, it assembles and generates things. Our next super cloud, we're going to talk about data platform. We tied Uber on. We actually, you, you actually call, it, call things the Uber of the enterprise as a categorical way how people should think. That involves search, that people, places, and things, a whole nother rethinking of, of data, essentially, They've built their own private cloud in innovation and public. They, all, they have all those tricks in, 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 in their trade craft at Uber and, and the enterprises are trying to copy that. I think this is where this goes. So to wrap up guys, I want to go around the horn and get your thoughts on VCF, this launch. Um, and VMware is now part of Broadcom starting to clear the runway a little bit. The, the smoke clears, we're seeing the new VMware emerge. What's your take on the new VMware and, and how does this transform with VCF? We'll start with Christoph, we'll go with you first. Well, um, you're talking about takeoff. I think, yeah, the, the, the plane has been uh, updated, upgraded, it's got new engines, it's ready to go. Uh, I think they're already well down the runway, so let's, uh, let's make sure everything goes well. I think it's going to be a, a great run for them. Uh, it's going to be an interesting journey. And again, um, integration, partners, uh, everything looks good to me. Dave, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's all about the roadmap, right? It's, now we've got a more focused uh, VMware, thanks to what Broadcom has done. And you know, that's their playbook is we're going to narrow the focus, we're going to invest, we're going to have a, an R&D roadmap, we're an engineering company, and that's the key. And, and stay close to your customers and you know, keep, keep them on that roadmap indefinitely. I mean, it's a durable business and there's no reason to leave if the investment is there. And that's what customers should be looking for. Rob. Yeah, I, I think that everything and the focus, like Dave was saying, uh, was definitely a key word. And I think that also ties back to the partners and their focus on going with partners, uh, not going it alone and really doubling down on that, especially with when you start to look at, and I'm expecting that we'll hear a lot about this at VMware Explore, uh, you know, in a little over a month now, that we'll see a lot about the partners, not just the CSPs and the hyperscalers, but also around a lot of the OEMs and the VARs and SIs, which will really bring some focus and take people that can build those apps, those mixture of experts types of agents and AI apps that are more than just Gen AI, where people want to go. And you know, that's going to help get to what Dave was talking about in driving revenue. 
Guys, I want to thank you all for coming on. I want to say SiliconANGLE, theCUBE, we love the deep tech analysis. We love to unpack everything, but the CUBE research team, you guys have been doing an amazing job of unpacking it and bringing it to life and actually unpacking all the data and actually putting it in context and helping people with their transformations. Uh, the content's been great. You guys have been doing some amazing research and thank you so much for coming on this special program for VMware's Cloud Foundation Transform because this is the next level we are there, it's legit, next level, Gen AI applications are coming. There are some blockers right now holding things back, this evolution, um, but you guys are nailing it, power law, great. Love that data, Dave, and you guys are doing great. Keep up the good work. And thanks to the Cube Collective out there as well, and our independent third party friends who contribute to the community, we appreciate you as well. Thanks for coming on and, and thanks, appreciate your, your time.